to Mission, God at Work, Faith in Action, a program that shows what God is doing all around the world. I'm Diane Becker. And I'm Steve Saint, working to empower Native God followers. We're here at our base of operation in Central Florida with lots of airplanes and other projects to show you. This is a powered parachute, and we might see it in action a little bit we later on. Hope. But on this show, we begin with a trip to Sri Lanka, just off the tip of India. Before I went, I knew there was a civil war there. There had been for 20 years. We went through 23 military checkpoints to get to the church I was working with. We drove through many towns that were bombed, and yet life just seems to go on. And you'll see that in the middle of war, God's love stands out even more. These are the children who have survived living in a war zone. The story of the Sri Lanka conflict is not simple. Ethnic and religious hatred has led to oppression, and the war is already 18 years long. The entire Tamil population in Sri Lanka are in a hopeless situation. They don't see the light even the end of the tunnel. Uh, we don't think that a settlement will be arrived between the government and the liberation tigers of Tamilugula. Both parties are building up for war. Uh, both parties are not going to stop the war. We cannot show you the fighting, although these children can show you the bullet holes from just weeks ago. We cannot show you the military checkpoints or the bombed buildings, for it is not safe, but we can show you a church where the people come to pray. St. John's Church in Batakaloa is an oasis in this war-torn land. Reverend S. J. N. Essen came here six years ago and saw many needs. From the beginning, world over, wherever there is a need, the church comes to the first place and do this. In this country, the government is not doing anything to cater for these orphans. So the church, particularly St. John's Church Batakaloa, we decided to support and look after the orphans. Three orphanages for 300 children, nine daycare centers for a thousand little ones, vocational training centers, programs for widows, many are helped. Almost 2,500 families or children or people are being looked after by different programs by our church. This girl's home has 140 girls from ages three to 18. Some of their parents were killed in the war, some girls were abandoned, other families are just too poor to keep them. But here, they have a place to call home. It's not only we give food and shelter and clothing to the girls who, who are in the girls' home, the wardens and me and the other people who are responsible in running this project, we are their parents, we are their brothers and sisters. So we have to feed them, we have to clothe them, we have to educate them, we have to bring them up in their life. More than that, we must keep them happy and we must give them hope. The boys and girls' homes are where everyone pitches in and does their share of the chores. <laughs> Karna Dawson came to the boys' home last year. His father had died and his mother couldn't take care of all four children. He says now he gets to eat three meals a day and has time to study. He wants to be a teacher. <laughs> More funding has allowed St. John's to expand once again to another nearby village where this will soon be home for 30 girls. The daycare centers provide a place for parents to leave their children while they work. At the nutritional feeding centers, the children come and play and are fed a good, healthy meal. Some villages are caught in the crossfire of the war. Their homes have been destroyed and they live in small huts. Nine people live here. Their economic situation is hand-to-mouth living. So they have no extra money to spend on their huts, on their houses. Whatever money they get out of their fishing, out of their shell collecting, 
just enough to give one time meal a day. Many of the village children had never been to school. St. John set up a school for street kids out under the trees. At present, uh, about 40 children come to church, but there are about 200 to 300 children in these two villages that's wandering on the street. Our ultimate aim to reach even the last child who is on the street. The vocational training center gives young people a place to learn a trade. They study electronics. They learn welding. They build and repair refrigerators. They learn carpentry, sewing, typing and computer skills. We had vacancies for only 140, but we got about 1,250 applications. There is no vocational training school in this area run by government or by private people. We should start this type of centers to cater for the youth so that the youth will have some hope in their life if they are not successful through their university education. They can live uh, successfully as peaceful citizens, as successful citizens by doing some vocational guidance. So this is also a center. We have a lot of hope for this center. The Widows Empowerment Project. 500 widows are given loans to start small businesses out of their homes, microeconomic enterprises. It's a chance to earn money and improve their lives. The Widows Empowerment Project is also a project uh, which was started because of the war, because of the husbands were killed in the war, and we gave them 2,500 rupees loan for them to set up a small industry, a cottage farming, a backyard farming, or to buy some chickens and have it at home, or buy a goat and have it at home, or to make some eats and sell and make some money. So each project was different from each other. Then we gave them 5,000 rupees loan. They are very good in repaying their loans. Most of them, they have come up in their life because we gave them some money. For those people, now we are planning to give 10,000 rupees loan. After that, we are sure that they will be self-sufficient. Not only we do this, I must tell you, our church is growing. We do have church planting program. We started four new churches in four new villages. Uh, even last Sunday, Eight people were baptized. This Sunday, about 42 are going to be confirmed as full members of the church, as my bishop is coming. In spite of poverty, dangerous situation, people are coming to Lord. Uh, people have a thirst to know about Christ, and they get uh, consolement in Christ. Not many people want to stay here in this place and work. As you know, even yesterday there was a bomb blast. Uh, we heard that six people were killed and about 10 were injured. Uh, this is a day-to-day -day situation. This is not news. Uh, this happens every other day for us. So staying and working here is not that easy. But we, some of us, understood the mission is not safe. The mission is not easy. The Christ mission means it is hard, it is dangerous. Uh, without blood, without scars, uh, there is no peace. Thank God that we could suffer and bring peace to the people who are living in and around us. More than any program, St. John's gives these young people peace and hope. Hope for a better future. Peace that only Christ can give. Please do pray for us. The number one need for us is your prayer. Please do remember us. Remember our church. Remember our people who are suffering and pray for us. Amen.
That's a profound statement. Without suffering, is. there is no Christ. I think in America, we tend to want to end suffering. And yet with the gospel story, there is suffering. And suffering is often where we meet God in a much deeper way. I can confirm that from my own experience, Diane. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, there's a missions memorial with a wall like the Vietnam Memorial in D.C. On it are engraved the names of people who have died for their faith or who have died in Christian service. I was asked to speak at their dedication service and only then realized that on that wall are the names of my father, four uncles, a childhood friend who was martyred as well, and my daughter Stephanie. But you know what stands out isn't the cost, it's the return that I've had for that. Wow. In Sri Lanka, they have paid a heavy price, but there are surely rewards ahead. There has been a ceasefire agreement and peace talks continue. There is much to rebuild in Sri Lanka. To connect with this work, you can go through the organization Veya Hafta, which in Hebrew means you shall love. Youshalllove.org, that's with the dashes. Mozambique stretches for 1,200 miles along the southeastern edge of Africa. Nearly two decades of civil war have left this country with extreme challenges, though. But in the middle of the pain and chaos, God is opening doors for missionaries to share the love and hope of Jesus Christ. God is at work in Mozambique. People in Mozambique live in fear. They need to be liberated from fear. Mozambique is a country that's known the ravages of war. 16 years of civil war, we have a lost generation. The destruction of selfish greed. The people were kept down. And has huge potential for demonstrating what the Church of Christ is supposed to be. The Church's life, Jesus' life. AIDS is spreading like wildfire. The driving force is, is to be able to feed yourself each day. We try to make a difference. There are a lot of opportunities for God's glory to shine. African Land Mission entered Mozambique during the communist era. It was at the end of 1985, and our first missionaries went in. At the invitation of local evangelical churches, the point was to develop leaders for those churches. The pastors that were here at the beginning if you asked them to open the Bible to the book of Ezekiel, they'd be searching for five minutes. They didn't know anything. It was a new church, an Acts-type church, a First Corinthians church. There was all this enthusiasm, but there wasn't a biblical basis for a lot of things that they were doing. We have a vision of training pastors and leaders, and that has happened quite a lot in the last 10 years or so. My name is Mark Budka. I'm from Trent, New Jersey. Jesus. My ministry here is theological education. I'm interested in discipling leaders. God shows up here in a very powerful way, in a very tangible way. I gave a test on spiritual gifts and I started to look at the results. People kept on coming up with miracles and signs and wonders, so I asked them, have you done a miracle? He goes, yeah. I looked at the other students and I go, have you all done miracles? Yeah, yeah. They lay hands on people and they pray for them and they really expect God to heal them and God does heal them. And the testimonies that I hear from people, it's usually because God has answered a prayer for health and they've been healed and they're still walking and talking about it. Some of the kids in the neighborhood have become my friends and I have a system where I get them verses to uh, memorize and then they, they, they get a New Testament to take home and to read for their own. I want to see the kids reach 
and give them direction in their lives because they're, they're the future Mozambicans. God has a message for their hearts and that they can be transformed like I was transformed by the gospel. They need some strong help and some strong guidance, especially in the area of moral values because if they don't, they will all be in AIDS pretty soon because that's the way the whole thing goes here. The official stance of the government was that AIDS didn't exist in the country. So within a couple of years of, of actually accepting the fact that AIDS was present, we have Bruce and Myra in place working with the churches to develop care groups within the churches to go out and provide compassionate care for those who are suffering from AIDS and for people in their families who don't know how to relate to the whole problem. The passion for why we're here is to, for the church to get involved in the AIDS crisis. Currently in the city of Baida, one out of every five people is infected with HIV. And the church is a key role to play in this whole AIDS crisis. Not only in the area of prevention, but also in the area of home care and reaching out to those who are sick and dying and bringing them into the family of hope. Those who are sick, who have been abandoned, have no other hope. And when somebody comes to them willing to care for them and wash them and make food for them, they realize there's something different because here in the city, people do not care at all for anyone else. They know their neighbor's dying and they will let them rot rather than take care of them. And when a group comes along that prays with you, it, it just opens the door for the gospel in incredible ways. Now, we can't think of anything else that we'd rather be doing than this. What's exciting to me is I teach the women of the church. To see them go from the stance of, I can't really learn anything, to sitting there listening to me and understanding what we're talking about and then interacting with me. That's exciting to see people that thought that either it wasn't their position to be able to learn about the Word or thought that they weren't capable of understanding what the Bible said. The last time we met they said, you know, we're growing. And I had never used that expression with them. We're growing. Next time, maybe one of us can study a verse and share it with some other people. Um, so that was just exciting to see them developing in that way and learning and growing. And the hope that I see for Mozambique and what really gets me excited is what it can be as the people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and their lives are transformed and their whole way of thinking is changed. Mozambique is a rich country. It's rich in natural resources. Its human resources are immense. And yet it has this mentality that says we're poor and we're nothing. And we'd love to see that change because the Lord Jesus died for them and he thinks they're worth it. This is another example of how God whispers to us in our joy, but he shouts his comfort to us when we're suffering. For more information about Africa Inland Mission, check out their website, aimus.org, or call their 800 number. Putting smiles on kids' faces and sharing God's love, that's what the Kids Around the World organization is doing, by building them big, beautiful playgrounds. Fidel Castro was right. During a Thanksgiving service for the homecoming of Elian, the young Cuban boy caught in a struggle between two countries, Fidel Castro talked of the importance of children and how we need to teach our children morals. He went on to share that morals come from the Bible. He never directly said that we should teach the Bible, but he implied it. He's right. Mr. Castro knows that once you reach the heart of a child, you have him for life. On September 11, 2001, the world as we knew it changed. The attack wasn't just on New York City and Washington, D.C., but on the world. Our president said it best. The fight against terrorism is going to take time, and we are in it for the long haul. As Americans, we are responding to the needs of our country. But our response must go further. If we're going to stop terrorism, we must reach the heart. President Bush says the war could last five to ten years. Do you realize that in 10 years, the eight-year-old child will be 18? If we're going to change the hearts of people for tomorrow, we must start with the children today. Kids Around the World is helping change the hearts of kids today. We believe that changing the hearts is done by God. We also believe that children need to hear of God through the teaching of His Word, the Bible. 
The Bible is full of stories of how to be honest, how to treat your fellow man, how to love one another. There are stories of forgiveness, healing, and hope. Stories of what God did and is still doing. Kids need to know these stories now so their hearts can be changed before it's too late. Kids Around the World not only builds big, beautiful playgrounds so children can play together and learn how to get along with each other, we also provide the teaching tools for children's workers around the world of all denominations, big and beautiful teaching tools that can help them teach the stories of the Bible, the greatest story ever told. We provide flannel grabs and puppets so that the stories of the Bible become interesting and alive. We want children today to have a changed heart for tomorrow. Won't you help us? We can only do as much as what we have helped, and the need is great. There are nearly six billion people on this earth, and 30% of them are children 14 years old and younger. That's 1.8 billion hearts. Wow, what a challenge. We have already begun the task in countries like Ukraine, Bosnia, Ghana, India, Honduras, Vietnam, Thailand, Albania, Cuba, and Venezuela. With your help, we can reach into countries like Pakistan, China, North Korea, El Salvador, Brazil, and Russia. Our focus has always been, and will always be, children. We need your help to accomplish the task that lies ahead. We're in it for the long haul. We are ready, but we must start now. Changing the heart of an eight-year-old will make the world a safer place for the future. You can help by donating to kids around the world. $12.50 a month or $150 a year trains one worker who sometimes reaches out to over 1,500 kids in that year. That's 10 cents a child. You can help by volunteering to come on staff to teach the eight-year-olds. We have opportunities for you. You can help by getting your church or organization to assist us with short-term project teams going worldwide. Will you help? The need is now. For more information about this organization, you can contact them on their website, kidsaroundtheworld.com. And this is a playground all its own. It is. But you know, Diane, when the Waurani asked me to go back and live with them in 1994, one of the things that they wanted was for me to teach them how to fly. We live in real rugged jungles and they wanted a way that they could take their elders around to the scattered villages in the jungle to teach and they wanted to be able to take medicines and dental equipment and services to their own people and when, when people were too sick to walk to the clinic they wanted to be able to fly them. So first we designed an airplane here at iTech and built it down there in the jungles but it was too complicated so we went back to the drawing board because the challenge for us at iTech is not to make indigenous people like the technology that we want to use but to make the technology fit them. So this is what we came up with for an aircraft, a highly modified powered parachute that Tamanta can use to carry up to three passengers or a stretcher patient or he can carry a barrel of fuel. It's so cool to see Indians flying. And now Tamanta has more time logged in an aircraft like this than I do. All right, can we power it up? Let's go. Thanks for watching. See you next time on Mission.